Hi and welcome back to Sensomed. In this video we'll continue our journey with the nephrology and what we'll talk about is gonna be glomerular filtration. What it is, how it works, and in order to understand glomerular filtration we need to understand the glomerulus itself. So we'll talk about the structures too. But first thing first, let's get some concepts out of the way. So what's the main function of the kidney? Well it's twofold. It is either to produce certain hormones such as erythropoietin, which you know is important for blood production, and to maintain the homeostasis. And the latter is the one we're going to focus on for now. That means removing waste, regulating blood pressure, and it does so through filtration, reabsorption, and obviously excretion of the waste material. So looking at this picture here, what we see is a concept picture of what a nephron does. And essentially, the whole idea behind the glomerular filtration it is that you want to be able to remove waste from your blood. At the same time, you want to reabsorb the important components of uh, whatever gets filtered. So your electrolytes, your water, and some solutes like glucose. And the whole premise falls as this. The afferent arteriole brings blood to the glomerular capillary. And true, uh, and the glomerular capillary bed is semi permeable to certain solutes and certain materials. Whatever gets through now goes into the renal tubules. Now, here's where the second step in this machinery comes to life that is the tubal reabsorption. Here's where we reabsorb most of the useful things that we want, like water, our solutes, like sodium and glucose. It gets back into the peritubular capillary and back into the blood circulation. And here's also where we can maximize our waste excretion because you see these paratubular capillaries, what they do as well is that they secrete back in more waste. In this way, we can maximize reabsorption as well as get rid of those extra waste material. The whole idea then again is to concentrate the waste. So in order to understand how the glomerular filtration works, we need to go behind the scenes. We need to know the structures that are behind the system. So first thing first, number one, what is the structure? This purple line that goes around this whole glomerulus, this is going to be your glomerular basement membrane. The next structure is a structure of the Bauman's capsule. Now, the Bauman capsule consists of a parietal layer which is these cells that you see this number two here and this is a simple squamous layer simple squamous epithelium the next structure is going to be your podocyte and they're going to make up your parietal layer uh, so this is your podocyte and this is uh, extension of the podocyte known as the pedicle these are the food processes and it's in between these food pro processes that you will have this filtration slit that we'll see later on where the filtrate will move across this white structure that you see here is going to be your capsular space or the Bowman's space. And moving on to these light purple pink structures or cells that you see here, these are your intermesangial cells. And where would then the extra mesangial cells be? They would be here. These are your extra mesangial cells. And together with the juxtaglomerular cells and the macula densa cells, which you see here, they form a structure known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus. This yellow structure that you see here, this is going to be your proximal convoluted tubule. This is where the filter is going to go. On the opposite side here, the C, this is going to be your distal convoluted tubule. Number eight is going to be your myocytes. They're going to act to constrict this number nine, which is your afferent arterial, meaning that this is where the blood comes in. And essentially it goes towards number 10, which is going to be your glomerular capillaries. And then that only leaves number 11, which is going to be the afferent arterial. So one of the things that determines the glomerular filtration is something known as the stalling force. And these are forces that drive the filtrate either towards the glomerular filtration or act to hinder the filtration. These are going to be two forces. One is the hydraulic pressure or the hydrostatic pressure. This is a pressure caused on by fluids. The other one is going to be the oncotic pressure. And simply what the oncotic pressure means is that there's going to be proteins, uh, for instance, in the glomerular capillaries. And since these proteins are osmotically active, they want to hold on to that fluid. So this is going to be a negative pressure, whilst the hydrostatic pressure is going to be a positive pressure. So there's two types of hydrostatic pressure. One is going to be in the glomerular capillary. The other one is going to be in the Bauman space. So one is going to be here and the other one is going to be here. And they oppose each other. 
because this pressure wants to drive the filtrate into Bauman space and this is gonna oppose that force. And for the oncotic pressure, it's a little bit easier since there are no proteins in the Bauman space, there is only one inside the glomerular capillary. And as I told you before, this is also gonna be a negative force because the proteins inside the glomerular capillary wanna hold on to that fluid or filtrate. They don't wanna let it go. So now we got two opposing forces, one, the oncotic glomerular force, as well as the hydrostatic force of the Bauman's capsule. And we got one positive or driving force, which is gonna be the uh, hydrostatic pressure of glomerular capillary. If we add this up, we get something known as the ultra filtration pressure. This is what you see. So take the difference between these two pressures. And this formula simply shows you the equation for that. These are just average numbers. You will see these numbers vary from textbook to textbook. So take these numbers with a grain of salt. Another thing to keep in mind is something known as the intrinsic membrane property, uh, designated KF. And this uh, only has two variables. One is the surface area. So if the surface area is large or small. And the other one is the permeability of the membrane. Is the me membrane permeable to a certain solute or not? So what can get filtered. Remember that we mentioned filtration slit earlier when we we're talking about the food processes of the podocytes. Now in between these food processes you will have small small slits or openings and they range in the size of 25 nanometer. Combine this with the permeability of the membrane and you will get a list of things that can pass through and become filtered. And these things are obviously going to be water and very small molecules such as ions and so on. LMB stands for low molecular weight molecules. Now larger molecules, high molecular weight molecules, as well as cells, especially red blood cells, are repelled. Now there's also another thing in the membrane which makes it more negative and this is known as the heparin sulfate. Now heparin sulfate is a negatively charged molecule and as so negative repels negative. So it makes it harder for negatively charged molecules to pass across this membrane and thus positively charged ones can pass through much easier. So how do we measure the flow then? There's something known as the glomerular filtration rate. Simply what this means is that it is the rate at which the glomerular capillaries can filter. Now the renal plasma flow is as the name suggests how much of the plasma that flows through the glomeruli and the renal blood flow is how much blood that gets to kidney. And in order to calculate the renal plasma flow and glomerular filtration rates, which are, by the way, important renal function tests, we need to know something about the renal clearance. So by measuring the renal clearance of a certain solute, how fast the kidney can clear a certain solute, we can then figure out the glomerular filtration rate and the renal plasma flow. And in that way, we can figure out the renal blood flow. So the glomerular filtration rate equals to the urine concentration of that solute times the urine flow divided by the plasma concentration of that solute. And the premise follows as this. The blood consists of cells, uh, mostly red blood cells, in a value of the hematocrit value. And for men, this lands around 45%, and for women, this figure is a little bit lower. And the rest of the blood would then be plasma. So if you use a tracer element, and you put it in the plasma and then you see how much of that tracer element that got filtered out uh, in a given unit of time usually it's minutes then you know the renal clearance of that tracer now imagine a tracer then that is freely filtered it is not reabsorbed in the renal tubules nor is it secreted from the peritubular capillaries it is only excreted into urine then that would give you the glomerular filtration rate wouldn't it and that substance is known as inulin it is actually used by nephrologists to determine say, the glomerular filtration rate without going into the calculation behind it it is going to be 125 milliliters per minute and this is our gfr now imagine then a tracer that has a higher clearance rate than that of inulin, which was 125, then that would indicate that it must be secreted from the peritubular capillaries, wouldn't it? And there is a substance such as that. This is the para amino -hipparate. It has a re renal clearance of around 650 milliliters a minute. And this equals to that of the renal plasma flow. And so now you're thinking, all right, I know that if solute has a higher clearance rate than that of inulin or the GFR of 125, it must be secreted. But what happens then if it has a lower clearance rate than that of the GFR? 
Well, you guessed it, it must be reabsorbed. So one of the solutes that we shouldn't see in, in the urine is glucose. So glucose is a solute that is completely reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. And so it has a renal clearance rate of zero milliliters a minute. And some others are actually in between. So these are partially reabsorbed, such as in the case of urea. Urea is actually a waste material, but it, to a part it is also reabsorbed. So amazingly, the renal blood flow is approximately 20% of the, the blood, which equates to approximately 1.2 liters a minute. We can get this number simply by taking the renal plasma flow and dividing it by taking 1 minus the hematocrit value, which kind of gives you uh, the same value as we calculated before, and that is 650 divided by 0.55, which equates to approximately 1.2 liters a minute. The renal plasma flow, the amount of plasma that got to the glomerular or the renal carpuscle, that was approximately 650 milliliters. Again, these numbers are just approximations and should be taken with a grain of salt. The last thing on our list is going to be the filtration fraction. Now, in order to get the filtration fraction, you simply take the GFR and you divide it by the renal plasma flow. That usually comes to approximately 20%. In the next video, we'll continue with the tubular reabsorption and secretion. So, hope to see you there.